do want to thank each of you for coming tonight because uh, actually as instead of war we have rare occasions to talk with this amount of people about the war in Afghanistan now. Uh, so I appreciate that and I appreciate the organizers Ben, particularly Ben's work in organizing this. Um, I would suggest to Ben and to others organizing discussions that one of the uh, problems with tonight's program, I think, is the narrow spectrum of difference there is between Al's and my position. And I regret that the Republican Party is not here tonight to try to defend what they did in Afghanistan and are still doing in Afghanistan and want to continue to do in Afghanistan. And I regret that representatives of the Democratic Party are not here tonight to defend their escalation of this war. Uh, but most regrettably, I regret that there are not Afghans uh, at this table with me to talk about what should happen in Afghanistan. And uh, I don't know if there are any <laughs> Afghans in the audience, but uh, I would like to defer to them later during the question and answer period if they are here, because I think their questions are the important ones we need to hear tonight. Um, my beginning of this talk was sort of influenced by the conversation last night between an Afghan woman uh, and a woman from Morocco about Islamic culture and particularly the role of a guest in Islamic culture. And what I'd like to do uh, in, in Islamic culture, the guest is honored and protected. Uh, and uh, you almost have an obligation to your guests uh, to protect them and honor them. And actually the Afghan woman said that that was one of the things the United States didn't understand in issuing a demand to the Afghan people that they give up the Al-Qaeda who they had hosted. Uh, that it was really culturally impossible for them to do that. Now, that was her take on it. Um, but as I started thinking about what we were talking about tonight, this question of guest came, came to me. And um, I want to pose a question as sort of the backdrop of our larger discussion, both tonight and, and next week. And I pose this as a child of the South, the American South, uh, whose paternal grandfather brandished a pistol on the courthouse steps to keep people from voting, and whose maternal grandfather, as a rural mail carrier, got up every day and delivered mail to those same people, and was treated as their guest as he opened the mailbox and found a cantaloupe, or what he would have called a mess of beans waiting for him. Uh, and uh, so I want to pose this question. Um, who is it that is most likely to bring people together and to create a common good? Is it the intruder or the guest? Uh, historically, in our own history, we might look at the question, did the Civil War end the, 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 the hatred and, this, and did it end the system that haunted the South for 250 years? Or did the civil rights movement, indigenous African Americans inviting guests from the North, create a more profound change in the South? So I just want us to think about the role of guest and the role of intruder as we think about Afghanistan. Now the points I'll make, Al has gone over some of them, but uh, as we look at this present escalation of the war, I think there's some immediate things we need to take into consideration. And I think both the decision to go to war and the decision to escalate it ignores history, both our own history and the history of the Afghan people. Um, it also increases the likelihood of civilian deaths, and I think the history is showing, the on-the-ground scene is showing, that it is increasing the likelihood of insurgency uh, there. It also, as uh, Al has referred to, destabilizes 
Pakistan further. It misdirects our own resources away from pressing needs here at home and into a, uh, into a war far away. It places diplomacy before, uh, war before diplomacy and it violates international law, namely the UN Charter. So let, let's go back over these one by one and look at them. First of all, the US war and its escalation under the Democratic Party leadership now ignores history. It ignores the history of the Afghan people and their resiliency to resist any foreign invader. Uh, from the British and Russians in the 19th century and then the Soviets in the 20th century. Uh, no one has left Afghanistan and been able to claim, as our for former president did, mission accomplished. And why do we think this new attempt at escalation is going to produce a mission accomplished with all that history? And then if we look into our own history and our escalation of the war in Vietnam uh, throughout the actually beginning in the 50s, the first American soldier died in Vietnam in 1955. So it was a 30-year beginning as, quote, a conflict and then a police action, and then finally people admitted it was a war and an invasion. Uh, but if we look at the history of that war and how we escalated it step by step, always claiming that there was a better situation on the ground than there actually was. And you have the parallels now of the Pentagon Papers and the, the Wiki Papers now. Um, and uh, so I think we need to look at our own history as well as this history of Afghan resistance to foreign invasion as we view uh, how we might get out. Um, the increase in civilian uh, deaths is something that is being documented almost every day now. Um, and the outrage over civilian deaths feeds the insurgency. It's a recruitment program for the Taliban. And so um, this pattern of putting troops on the ground in more remote areas, at least according to Human Rights Watch, actually increases the likelihood of civilian casualties because they have documented that most of the civilian casualties that have been caused by US troops and NATO troops have been caused and have happened in a situation in which NATO or US troops were on the ground, trapped, in a situation beyond their capacities, called in airstrikes, which then indiscriminately bombed the area. And that's where most of the civilian casualties that have been the res responsibility. The other thing is that the, the, uh, the night raids that are taking place now, even tonight in Kandahar, or I guess it's already morning in Kandahar <laughs> now, but every night there are these night raids going on. <coughs> and, um, and they're really driving whole families uh, away from us as they have their homes invaded, uh, the men in the family taken from the home, uh, and detained for periods of time, uh, if not killed on the spot in target killings. The Afghan Rights Monitor, uh, short, uh, short for ARM, uh, has reported last week that the US-led campaign in Kandahar has destroyed and, and damaged hundreds of houses. Civilian deaths have spiked since the operations started in Kandahar province in early September. The Human Rights Watch responded to a UN report, which was earlier this summer, on the casualties during the first six months of this year. And the, the, and the report that the UN did said that the ca civilian casualties had gone up 31%, uh, but it added that most of them had been caused by uh, insurgent violence and not the US and NATO troops. And the, um, the Human Rights Watch responded to this saying that the UN report 
of 31% increase in civilian casualties in the first six months of 2010, when NATO forces moved into uh, the, the area, particularly residential areas, as they were doing a move, uh, movement in Kandahar, they put civilians at risk because they are a magnet for those anti-government elements who then bring in roadside bombs and suicide attacks in response to the US or NATO movement into a particular area. Also, as NATO and uh, US forces move into an area like that, a remote area, the people who do not resist them are labeled collaborators and then are subject to insurgent assassinations. So this is the context of the increase in civilian casualties right now. And as I said earlier, it is driving people into the insurgency. This issue of Pakistan, uh, again, reminds some of us with a longer sense of history of the movement into Cambodia during the Vietnam War uh, on the rationale then and the rationale now that the insurgency was using this other country as a base for its operations. Um, but it, as, as Al has said, Pakistan is a very complex place in, in and of itself. And, uh, but what we have done there over the last two years uh, is really uh, expanding the war into Pakistan. It threatens to deeply further divide Pakistanis and further weaken their fragile government. The US escalation in Afghanistan will be at best, it will be at best drive the Taliban and Al Qaeda fighters back into bases in the Pakistan. And do we really want that kind of, uh, of pressure on the situation in Pakistan? A new, um, new America Foundation report released uh, just yesterday uh, says that the United States has launched 96 drone strikes in northern Pakistan, northwestern Pakistan this year. And that's compared to 53 in 2009. And of course, we're not through with 2010 here. This brings the total number of such strikes since 2004 to 192. And this, uh, this uh, new American Foundation study states that between 1,234 and 1,899 people have been killed uh, according to reliable press accounts in these drone attacks. Of these, the study estimates that two-thirds of the uh, deaths have been militants and one-third civilians. However, in estimating and labeling people as civilians or militants, this is done primarily by the local government or the military itself, and civilians interviewed at the scene have put the, um, the civilian deaths much higher than that. So we're creating another mess from which we may have to ex uh, uh, find a way out of three, four, five years from now in Pakistan. And we're destabilizing a country, which is a nuclear power. Um, although I guess they don't really admit it, but they are. I guess Pakistan doesn't you know. admit it. Um, so it's just a creating a very dangerous situation uh, to destabilize this, that government. I won't go into detail on the misdirection of our own resources. I think most of us can see that. With $4 billion a month going into this war in Afghanistan stand alone, uh, Will we ever have the resources for health care, alternative energy, new jobs, education, and affordable housing? I've got one minute left. So I want to, I guess, focus, I'll focus later on the violation of international law and just focus this last few seconds on the question of diplomacy. And uh, first of all, a survey was released today showing that 83% of adult Afghans favor negotiations with the Taliban and other armed groups toward reconciliation and a national government. Um, the problem is uh, that the US policy now of escalating the war is actually attacking those elements of the Taliban who are, 
have either indicated an interest already in negotiations or are in fact um, uh, have been a part of the negotiations. Uh, last month, we killed a man who had left the Taliban to organize other insurgent groups into a body that could negotiate. Um, and we went into his home and killed him as a part of one of these night raids. I'll leave, the, leave it at that for now. Thank you. <laughs>